about a decade ago, I headed to the West Bank for a few reasons. At the time, Israel was a big international news story because the country was being struck by a wave of Palestinian terrorist attacks called the Second Antifada. The international community was especially focused on Israel because it was in the process of building up a massive security wall or fence, whatever you want to call it, separating the Palestinian-dominated West Bank from the rest of Israel. And the following year, I was set to begin a PhD in political science at UCLA. So I hope to gain something valuable from the field research. I spent a lot of my time those days in taxi cabs, cruising between Jerusalem and the West Bank. I wanted to see the wall and to understand it from both Israeli and Palestinian perspectives. The Israelis explained to me how they would have preferred to resolve their problems with the Palestinians through peaceful negotiations, but that Israeli support for the peace process had plummeted with every Palestinian terrorist attack on an Israeli bus, restaurant, and nightclub. As long as Palestinian terrorist groups like Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad were committed to terrorizing Israeli civilians, the Israeli government had no choice but to crack down on the terrorists and to fence in the population from which they hailed. Of course, the Palestinians I spoke to had a very different perspective. They emphasized how destructive the wall is for them. Palestinians showed me how the wall humiliates them by restricting their movement, how the wall impoverishes them by preventing them from working in Israel, how the wall physically separates family members from even visiting one another, and perhaps worst of all, how the wall harms Palestinian nationalist aspirations for an independent Palestinian state. Because I was headed to grad school the following year, I had this habit of printing out academic articles on terrorism to read during these excursions. I wanted to find out from the leading scholars in the world why terrorist groups like Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad would blow up innocent civilians in buses, in restaurants, in nightclubs. All of the studies said the exact same thing, that aggrieved groups turn to terrorism because of its effectiveness in pressuring government concessions. According to the conventional wisdom, terrorism is the very best way for people to induce government accommodation. As proof, scholar after scholar pointed to the Palestinians, whom they described as, quote, the paradigmatic example that terrorism pays. I was immediately struck by the disconnect between what scholars were saying about terrorism and the reality on the ground. Terrorism sure didn't seem to be working out well for the Palestinians. Instead of coercing Israeli territorial concessions, Palestinian terrorism buried the peace process and then built the security wall, the most visible symbol of the Israeli occupation. I began to wonder, wow, if the Palestinians are the success story, then how do other groups fare politically when they use terrorism? As a grad student at UCLA, I began publishing the first studies ever done on how governments respond politically to terrorism. But the more I looked, the less support I found for the conventional wisdom. Take Al-Qaeda, a case many of you know quite well. Like the Palestinians, Osama bin Laden issued all sorts of political demands in the run-up to 9-11 for US military forces to withdraw from the Muslim world for the US to stop supporting Israel and pro-American Muslim rulers like Mubarak and Musharraf, 
and for the U.S. to stop killing Muslims around the world. But in response to the 9-11 attacks, the U.S. did the political opposite. We invaded and then occupied Muslim countries, like in Afghanistan and Iraq. We strengthened relations with Israel and pro-American Muslim rulers. And all of a sudden, there was this unprecedented groundswell of American public support for the Bush administration's aggressive foreign policies, which ended up killing countless Muslims around the world. Over time, I was able to establish that these cases aren't anomalous. I analyzed the political plights of every group ever designated by the U.S. State Department as a foreign terrorist organization. And what I found is that not a single one, not a single terrorist group, had ever managed to successfully pressure the target country into making major political concessions by attacking their civilians. Across political contexts and data sets and statistical models, I've consistently found that the conventional wisdom should be turned on its head. Far from being a winning political tactic, terrorism is a losing tactic that encourages governments to dig in their political heels and to crack down on the perpetrators and the surrounding population. This finding has both positive and negative implications for all of us. The good news is that governments will continue to resist terrorist demands. During the Cold War, the West worried about the political map going red. But you don't have to worry about opening up the newspaper one day and finding out that Sharia law has suddenly been adopted in capitals throughout the world. When you turn on the radio, you're still going to hear Macy Gray, not Islamist fatwas. For the foreseeable future, terrorism will remain deadly, but politically ineffective. The bad news is that already, governments are exploiting our international aversion to terrorism in order to shore up their own power at the expense of our civil liberties. This has been a tragic, undocumented legacy of 9-11. Armed with a counterterrorism card, governments around the world are exaggerating the terrorism threats in their own countries to enact aggressive policies that end up harming law-abiding citizens. It's no coincidence that in our own country, the most egregious violations of government surveillance have happened in the shadow of 9-11. Our digital privacy is now a thing of the past. Your internet searches, emails, text messages, even phone calls to your mother are all subject to government scrutiny in the name of counterterrorism. The cold truth is that civil liberties wilt in the face of counterterrorism security. The mere mention of the word counterterrorism seems to strengthen the hand of the executive at the expense of our individual rights especially for minority groups. But the problem is even more severe in illiberal countries. From China, to Egypt, to Libya, to Bahrain, to Turkey, to Russia, to Syria, governments are labeling peaceful dissidents as terrorists to gain popular support for crushing them. This strategy isn't just immoral, it's also counterproductive, because treating peaceful dissidents as terrorists is actually the surest way to spawn them. Thank you very much.